tonight. Very excited to um, uh, have everyone here for uh, how Instagram is changing the world. I uh, want to welcome Fred Richin, the moderator, the dean of ICP. Um, he's a dear friend. He's um, uh, hopefully familiar to all of you. Please, if you have not known about him, um, uh, make sure you look him up. Make sure you look up the books that he's written. Um, I think he's one of the most interesting and challenging thinkers in the space of photography today and what is coming at us. Um, apart from being the dean of the school, he's also been a professor of photography and imaging at NYU. Um, uh, he uh, co-directs at, uh, uh, at NYU and the Magnum Foundation, um, uh, the Human Rights Program with Susan Mizellas. Uh, he's been an editor at the New York Times. Already in 94 and 95, um, uh, he conducted a research project for the New York Times on how to transform print newspaper media into multimedia publications. Um, he's co-founded Pixel Press in 99, where um, uh, a lot of online uh, journalism, photojournalism happened back in that uh, uh, a time when most of us were only really getting familiar with the internet. Um, uh, without further ado, Fred, I would like to uh, pass the word over. Oh, one more thing, actually, that I forgot to mention before. We are starting something new today, and this is that we are taking uh, hashtag questions via Twitter. So if you use the hashtag ICP Talk or ICP Talks, um, on Twitter, this counts for the live audience that is coming in through the live feed. Um, uh, please use the, this hashtag with questions that you have for the Q&A period afterwards. We're excited. Um, hopefully, many people send some questions in. And uh, Fred is going to introduce our wonderful speakers tonight, which I'm super excited to have them. Uh, I'm just told... So I don't forget there is a reception afterwards, uh, so you're all invited to continue the discussion when we finish. So you know that ICP was founded uh, by Cornell Kappa, largely in memory of his brother Robert Kappa. Robert Kappa is famous for his work in the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s, among many other things that he did. But he was an innovator, just the way we're looking at tonight, in terms of technology. His generation of photographers were the first to use of uh, small cameras, 35 millimeter cameras, fast films, and that made it possible to photograph war from close up. So his famous statement, if your pictures aren't good enough, you aren't close enough, could not have been made 10 years before. It was a new time. His colleague, Henri Cartier-Bresson, said about photojournalism, he defined it as keeping a journal with a camera, which, also reminds me very much of what we're going to be talking about tonight in terms of keeping a journal with a camera, in this case, using Instagram. Both of them came of age at the time of the new picture magazines, which started in the late 1920s and 1930s in Europe, Life magazine in the US. And that was a new platform at that point for people to disseminate imagery in a productive way, often weekly, and changing the way pre-television we all thought about the world. So to me, it's fitting just to call back to these sort of ancestors of this institution as we start tonight, because sometimes we think of new media as the only new media that ever was. There's been new media in the 1930s. There's been new media many times over in history. And this is another incarnation of what we're looking at. So tonight, we'll be talking about how is Instagram changing the world, but also is Instagram changing the world? It's not meant as a celebration of Instagram, a branding exercise, but it's meant as kind of an interrogation of social media platforms, Instagram in particular, and asking, you know, what do they do differently? What do they do better? What do they do worse? What do they allow? What don't they allow? Is there a future with them? Do we know more about the world? Are the people using it having greater impact on us than conventional media might? you know, asking these sorts of questions. And we have three distinguished, wonderful panelists this evening. And the way we'll do it is that each one will show their work for 10 to 15 minutes, the three of them one at a time. Then, you know, we'll be asking each other questions and then open it up to everybody else for questions as well. Okay? So Instagram, I believe, comes from the conjunction of two words, Instamatic, the old Instamatic camera, 
and Telegram, uh, as well in terms of you know where the word comes from, and again it you know calls back to other traditions from before. Okay, so here is the story of Live Love Beirut. So it was summer 2012, and this was the last image uh, when I I was visiting. Uh, for the summer, I was living in California, and I was there for about a month. And as always, it's not the most peaceful part of the world. There were riots, and they were closing the airport roads, um, burning tires, etc. And for s our parents are not getting any younger, and our friends in Lebanon and outside of Lebanon, when you hear the name Beirut or the country's name, you always think of disturbance and uh, political instability. So we're like, F that. There is this too, and this is also Beirut, and this is most of Beirut. It's food, it's life, it's the sea, it's the mountains, and it's the people. So my friend Eddie and I, uh, we sat together, and my uncle had this name in his head. It was Live Love Beirut, and the idea of making a bracelet. So we were brainstorming and thinking, and how uh, could we turn this into a positive mov movement and create a community out of it? So Instagram was just starting um, back in August 2012. We created a hashtag and asked people um, to only share beauty. So this was our rule, find beauty, capture it, and share it. And then the bracelet was just for us a tool to spread the world and for people to wear and always think to find beauty in the small little details. So the principle is crowdsource and curate. Uh, we created an Instagram account, and every day we curated and selected the five most beautiful images. And this is the result. Uh, for example, there were, nobody knew that there were surfers in Lebanon, and there was this um, one. I knew his Instagram handle. It's Danny111. He used to surf up there. And we started reposting his images. And after we did, uh, people started to know about that and started to go surfing with him. So. A, completely new surf movement started to rise up north. Everybody landing in on Beirut told us, hey guys, I'm coming home, hashtag live love Beirut, and then we reposted that, and it was very emotional and beautiful to see. Um, the mountains, the ski seasons, were ve very heavily promoted. A lot of people think that because we're in the Middle East, we're a desert, it's not. People did their research, uh, they went really drove miles for us. They found, for example, an old, um, Bill and went up to the same castle and took took that picture. Um, we didn't knew we didn't know there were deers uh, up in the Bika, which is the agricultural zone. So I found out that actually a week ago that only 55% of our followers are in Lebanon, and it's quite amazing to me that we actually have 45% of people that follow Live of Beirut that are outside of the country. And uh, today it's uh, 6.2 million cumulative likes on Instagram and about 100,000 followers. The bracelet has traveled to the four corners of the world and this is all Live Love Beirut bracelets and not, not any country. So to Bolivia, to Tulum, to Ecuador, to Sydney and now we're doing a fun competition. So anybody that has the bracelet and is traveling sends us a picture, hashtags it back to Beirut. Uh, we're actually offering plane tickets to bring them back to visit their hometown. In May 2014, the new Minister of Tourism was about to come out with a new campaign. And the Saatchi, MC Saatchi, was pitching him a concept. And we get there literally a day before they get to print. Last year in May, we only had 20,000 followers. And we get, through a friend of a friend, we get to the minister and we're like, please use Live Love Lebanon as, as your campaign. Take what we have. We already have 50,000 images. It's wonderful. Look at all those people. And he accepted. So it became the official campaign of the nation. And there is actually numbers that show that it actually raised tourism by 18%. So the rule was to never show negative images uh, until we got, we got this image. This was um, right by uh, this lake up in the mountains. And it was just too hard to sit and look at it. It is hashtag live love Beirut and not to post it just because we have this rule. So we reposted the image, but we wrote under it, um, this is a situation, who wants to come clean the river with us next Saturday? If you want to, just write your email and a comment. An hour later, we had 100 and 
80 uh, emails. So we sent out a newsletter and we're like, who wants to come clean it with us? And the next Saturday, there was about 60 people that uh, drove all the way to the river with us and we cleaned it up. And this led to us doing regular Live Love events. For example, this is another lovely, lovely picture. Um, a blogger posted this image of, of a child. He's a refugee. And he hashtagged, um, he wrote a comment in hashtag, he should be with them, uh, the kids that are coming out of the movie theater with, the, with their school. Uh, we reposted this, and people's reactions are really very beautiful. And then Eddie, my co-founder, had the idea. It was Christmas, and he wanted to give out Christmas gifts to all the refugee children on the streets. Uh, today, one in four people in Lebanon uh, is actually a refugee. So he called up the children's store uh, called Jouet Club, and he's like, would you give us Christmas gifts? We really want to go out in the streets and give them to children. Uh, but how? But then the other issue was how are we going to find the children? So we asked people to, whenever they found a child, to take a picture on Instagram and to geolocate it. And then <laughs> he, he put 400 gifts in his car and drove around to every pin and gave out presents. Uh, so this is, those are some pictures. And the comments we have are really, really amazing. Um, this one I love. You guys are proof that humanity still exists. Um, it's really not us. It's, it's the people. Because if we do this and we get no reactions, then it doesn't mean anything. And ev everything that we do is really a dialogue between us and our audience. None of this is uh, premeditated. Did I pronounce this right? So we uh, ended up by uh, starting a nonprofit. It's called Live Love Lebanon. And the bracelet is not sold anywhere. Uh, we do not want to place it in any store. This is um, very important for us because it has value. We only sell it in select festivals and locations, and the money always goes to fund a local project or a cause. Uh, for example, on the upper left corner, this is Nasib. Uh, he's been selling chiclets on the same street corner for the past 10 years. And uh, Eddie always saw him, so we decided he was going to be the only official reseller of the bracelet. And all the money goes to him. So instead of selling chiclets, he sells bracelets now. The first time we gave him bracelets, he didn't really understand what this pack was. And he ended up cleaning himself with it, thinking it, w it was a, a sponge. <laughs> Uh, we rehabilitated a neighborhood, for example, painted the stairs, etc. Okay, so brands. Uh, whenever you have people's attention and people following you, you know advertising companies are going to call you as well as brands. I was very super reluctant to work with brands. Um, and uh, I, I, I fought with a few art directors, uh, but, uh, but Eddie really insisted, so... So after talking and, okay, what can we do that also fits our image and what we want to do in our community, but that also can benefit a brand. And this is one of my favorite campaigns that we did with Renault. Uh, so they wanted to promote their new Clio. And what we did is that we placed the, the Clio all over the country. And we asked people uh, every time they found the Clio to hashtag Clio plant slab. And then we asked the car company to plant a tree for every picture that people take. So it ended up in planting a forest of, of 400 trees and in marketing the car. And people won incentives and gifts every time they took a picture. And the most creative picture with the car would win like membership to, to a beach resort. So you can see the students uh, really went out of their way to, uh, to try to impress us. So it served the country, it served the brand, and, and people had fun. Another one of my favorites is this movie. It's a local film called Khadi. And it's a film about ch a child with Down syndrome. And he pretends he's an angel. So he wears angel wings for people to accept his physical difference as him being a being that is not from this earth. Uh, so what we did is that we placed angel wings all over the city's balconies. And we asked uh, Société Générale de Bank to donate $10 every time people took a picture of the angel wings to the um, Organization of Children with Down Syndrome. So p people found the wings, took pictures of them, and uh, about a weekend, we get a call from the bank, and they're like, guys, please stop the campaign because we're going over budget. <laughs> 
I didn't think uh, I don't think they wanted to give out more than about fifteen hundred dollars, but they ended up giving twenty eight hundred dollars. But the most beautiful part was that our followers that were not in Lebanon and that didn't have the wings that we placed over Beirut on their balconies made their own wings out of paper and went out in their own streets and took images to give back to the little nonprofit of children with Down syndrome in Lebanon. That was really beautiful. Uh, another campaign that we did with American Eagle, we um, tagged the eagle all over the city next to uh, tourist, tourist uh, destinations, and they were all on the floor, don't worry, we didn't damage the city. Um, and people had to go find them, so every time they found them, they took a picture and then they visited the site. So, um, on, a, on a macro level, Live Love Lebanon is about the country and Live Love Beirut is about the city. But what Live Love really does is that it, create a, it creates a community that shares um, its shared interest. So what we uh, ended up doing, and this happened very naturally, was that students in universities wanted to start Live Love accounts for their colleges to share their campus lives. So now every university in Lebanon has its own Live Love account with its Live Love ambassadors, and they share you know, their daily, daily lives, their exams, the sports that's going on, the events that are going on on campus, and they're actually the official communication channels of the college's administrations, which is really great. Uh, same thing happened on smaller cities uh, throughout the country. So every city now has its Live Love account as well. Uh, one, some of those we did directly with the municipalities, and most of them are just guerrilla, just uh, people that really love uh, certain cities that share images on, on the hashtag and then uh, crowds curate it. We also have a moving exhibition booth. It's a little container that we painted ourselves and we put projectors inside. And we also coded a little uh, Instagram projection in processing. Uh, we also put a connect sensor up there and then people can move the pictures around and dance with them, etc. So what started happening was that people in other developing countries uh, wanted to start their Live Love accounts. They actually didn't even ask us, they just started it. And that's the beauty of it. Uh, it, is, it doesn't really belong to us. So, but we called them uh, very quickly and we're like, hey guys, we have a Bible and we, we, we have branding and we have a recipe for um, making a Live Love campaign work and uh, for it to have a really great impact on everyone around you. Do you want to do it with us? So this is what happened in Egypt and Jordan and Venezuela. They're also selling bracelets and using the profits for their own local projects. I discovered this last week uh, and then they didn't call us or anything. They just started and they had, uh, I think they're like 2,000 followers. They also made bracelets. So we called them up and we're like, hey guys, uh, we should really work together. And, uh, and they accepted. So as of next week, we're going to be doing this together. Uh, a bunch of celebrities took interest in the bracelet as well. Uh, and to wrap this up, I want to I wanna go over something that we started uh, in March, a Snapchat account. I was also very reluctant to do a Snapchat account, but Snapchat is really awesome. <laughs> so we posted this picture and we're like, hey guys, follow us on Snapchat and send us your bracelets pictures. So the pictures that I showed you in the beginning of the document, they took two years to document. Um, you know, people in Bolivia, in Paris, in Berlin, etc. week after, it, it didn't happen overnight. So one day on Snapchat, and this is what happens, we get images from all over the world of people drawing from Boston, Turkey, Kuwait, Oman, Belgium, Dubai, Canada. And this, this was really in 12 hours, we had 1,012 images. And the beauty of it is that people on Snapchat, they don't post the image for everyone to see. They send it directly to you. So they don't think twice about sending you something. They just put it out there. Um, and we have a really, really direct dialogue happening between us and, and our Snapchat uh, followers. And this really, really great um, Lebanese artist, uh, his name is Giorgio Copter. He's been doing Snapchat drawings for years, and he's the one handling uh, our Snapchat account now. Uh, the first one who started it was just uh, Omar, our third co-founder. 
so this is, uh, for example, something uh, how creative we can get with Snapchat that we can't do with Instagram. Uh, we posted a story and we're like, screenshot the next snap, fill in the blank, and we will repost it. Before I die, I want Lebanon to write whatever you want to write. And uh, those are a few uh, snaps that we have received to change, to be known worldwide, to thrive, to be left alone, to be united, to have free chocolate, to have a dog park. It doesn't have a dog park yet. <laughs> to elect a president, it doesn't have a president either. <laughs> Um, and then just not to keep it digital and up there in the clouds, we always like to have a, you know, impact on the ground. Um, school students went under this bridge and painted all the things that we received um, under the bridge and it's just beautiful street art now. Uh, and I want to end with this comment that we've received. Uh, Thank you, Live Love Beirut, for believing in us. It's really, it's really not us doing anything. People provide all the content, and people react, and people listen. And it's Live Love Beirut is honestly every single person out there just sending an image, um, and it's a beautiful dialogue. And yeah, this is this is my story. So I don't have a, a big presentation. Um, I told Fred we just, um, I think I was invited because we just launched last week and we're very excited about it, a grant um, in collaboration with Instagram. Um, and I want to give the thinking really behind this grant. Um, and then uh, Fred also asked me to go into some of uh, the Instagram accounts that you know I, I like or have, um, helped um, inspire our thinking. And um, so, so to go into the, into the grant, um, the Getty Images Instagram grant, um, Getty Images has been awarding grants for over 10 years now. Um, and we always think about what can we do to, to really have an impact and, and rethink our grant program. Uh, we've given over or close to a million dollars over the years. And in the last year, um, Pancho, who is our director of photography for news, and I um, have had several conversations about the fact that we felt that there are photographers out there doing amazing work in local communities that don't necessarily have um, the support or access to mainstream media. Um, and um, when we started um, discussing, you know, things that how to go about helping these photographers, a grant seemed, you know, like the right thing to do. And when we started thinking about but how do we find these photographers, um, Instagram came as the perfect um, sourcing platform because there are so many photographers um, today and citizens that document really important um, and underrepresented issues or communities that essentially turn to Instagram um, to publish. And one of these photographers, and I, I want to mention her real quick and, and show her account, was Camille Lepage. Um, when Teru and I started discussing the grant together, Teru works um, at Instagram, um, he referenced um, Camille a lot. Camille was a French photographer. Um, she died um, in uh, uh, the, the Republic of, um, in CAR, the, uh, sorry, it's like Centre Afrique in French, um, Central African Republic, uh, last year, May 12th. Um, and Camille didn't have the support of mainstream media and she published a lot of these images on Instagram and she was definitely one of our sources of inspiration for this grant, so I wanted to mention her name. Um, and then talking more about some of um, the work that I like on, on Instagram, and I follow closely on, on Instagram, uh, and not to go into Austin's talk, so I hope I don't reach there, but one of the ones I really like is actually Everyday Incarcer Incarceration. Um, Everyday Incarceration is not about um, is not about a particular country, it's about a community, it's about the community of people that are incarcerated. And I'm just really 
um, blown away on a daily basis by the, the, the variety of work that's being shown, uh, the captioning and the in-depth, um, not just the variety in terms of the photography that's being shown, I mean, obviously there are, but the difference, the, 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 the various points of view into that particular topic. Um, and it shows, you know, specific issues rela related to uh, teenagers in this particular case or juvenile incarceration. It also shows um, um, images more related to family and what happens after. And there are so many entry points into that account that are really um, amazing and can sort of take you down a rabbit hole um, and, and, and get you really thinking about this issue in a different way. So that's one of the accounts that I, I really, really, really like. Um, another one, and obviously that shows also the power of the medium, um, has uh, shown up in the last couple of weeks, and that's uh, Nepal Photo Project. Um, and that again is a communal account working you know, with photographers um, and a community essentially reposting from photographers on the ground. And it, again, not just shows um, images that are, you know, related to the devastation um, and um, what is uh, happening after, you know, the, the, the earthquake, but also um, helps to find people, to help people. So it has a very active role um, in the community as well. Um, and can help people on the ground. Um, so I have also been following this account very closely and um, seeing what it can do, also celebrating some of the people helping people on the ground. And the last one might be a little bit more controversial, especially in this um, sanctuary of photojournalism, um, but I thought I would bring it up, and that's Beyonce. Okay, I like Beyonce. Uh, my daughter likes Beyonce even more. She, I love baby pictures, and she happens to have very cute ones. But the reason why um, I bring up Beyonce, it is because Beyonce has been the, really the first celebrity to use uh, not just Instagram, but social media to really address her audience directly. So if you think about it, when... Um, her daughter was born, she could have gone to Vanity Fair, she could have gone to People magazine, and she could have made a lot of money, which, I mean, obviously she doesn't need, but she could have used mainstream media to publish the first um, images of her daughter. And instead, she decided to, she actually did not publish to Instagram, she published to her own blog at the time. I mean, her, I think her daughter was born in 2010, so Instagram was still very early. She might have used Instagram then um, at that point. But what that says is that there is a bypass um, in Hollywood now of traditional media um, in favor of talking to an audience directly. And what I find fascinating in this case and looking at a little bit of a different angle is that, you know, frankly, like, you know, I'm not sure her publicist would have approved that picture to go into a magazine, you know? And that actually, if you look at today's celebrities' Instagram accounts, um, you find their most personal, daring pictures there. And that's a new way for these celebrities to also address um, their, their followers. So I just thought that was an interesting uh, paradigm. And that's it. Um, so when I say Africa, what comes to mind? For many people, it's something like this. Or that. Or that. Everyday Africa was created in an effort to rise above these kinds of stereotypes. Um, it started on a reporting trip to Ivory Coast about three years ago in March of 2012. Peter DeCampo and I were on assignment there and we were trying to cover a story. It was a post-conflict story in Ivory Coast. Um, it was an important story. It was a very under-reported story. 
Um, but while we were there, we were doing the kinds of things that you might expect a writer and a photographer team to be doing on an assignment like that. Uh, we were visiting um, displaced persons camps. Uh, this is a village that was uh, destroyed about two weeks before our arrival. A woman who'd been raped by soldiers. Refugees who were on the way home from Liberia for the first time in a year who were celebrating once they got back to their village for the first time in a year, but quickly to find that many of their homes had been destroyed. Local traditional hunters who were conscripted into militia forces and another home that had been destroyed. These are the photographs, these are some of Peter's photographs from that trip, and I was speaking to some of these very same people um, that, that are in these, in these pictures. Um, we were frustrated by this experience. I had been a Peace Corps volunteer in Ivory Coast in the mid-90s. Peter had been a Peace Corps uh, volunteer in Ghana in, in the mid-2000s. We had each spent a lot of time on the continent, and we, we knew that even though this was an important story and was, there was nothing made up about it, at the same time, um, it didn't do a very good job of actually representing what, what real life was like at that moment in that place. Um, so, we started doing something else uh, while we were doing our reporting. This is the first Everyday Africa photograph, and it's simply a, we were riding the elevator up to get our press passes in Abidjan, and Peter saw this scene with the lights and the mirror and the man in the middle and wanted to photograph this, but also didn't want to get in trouble, didn't want to pull out his big camera, so he just pulled out his, his iPhone and snapped it that way. And over the course of the, of the trip, doing some of the same photographs I just showed you, we were also taking pictures of everyday life. Uh, this is a cell phone store in the shopping mall, a couple of car mechanics, the woman who was a receptionist at one of the hotels we, were stay we stayed in, our favorite breakfast shop. You know those, um, those ads we've all seen on TV? For 50 cents a day, you can save a child in Africa. And there's always some kid with flies in their face or something. Well. Peter saw this kid and he wanted to take his photograph and it's like the father had seen those ads too and was saying, you're not taking that picture of my kid. So he came over to wipe his nose really fast, but didn't think about the cigarette. <laughs> that picture of the, the line, the refugee uh, cars, minivans coming back from Liberia, this is taken about 10 feet from that photograph. And so instead of just a picture of refugees coming home, um, they were each given a, a living allowance from the United Nations, and what a lot of them were doing was taking some of that money to purchase DVDs from the roadside so that when they got home, they could watch a movie. And this guy is a guy I photographed in this village. Which is, we spent several days here. It was racked with destruction. Um, he shows up, and I wanted to interview him, and we talked to him about the village and what's going on and tell us about the conflict. And, all he wanted to do was talk about his nightclubbing and his favorite music and the, the dance clubs he goes to in Abidjan. And, and that's all he wanted to talk about. And I also felt like I live in Bro Brooklyn and I felt like this guy could be my neighbor. So Everyday Africa started right after this trip. We, we, it, we started as a Tumblr blog. Um, Peter was quickly on assignment to Uganda uh, about the same time I was on assignment in Zimbabwe. So we sh were sharing pictures with each other. Uh, over the course of the next few months, it began to grow. Uh, we have a lot of photographer friends who share our frustrations about the ways in which this part of the world is depicted, uh, who joined up. And soon we were on, we were on Instagram. Um, and it sort of exploded, exploded from there. Um, you know, everyone, Everyone loves Instagram, um, and especially uh, kids. And so it was a natural kind of step from there to take this project into classrooms. Um, we began um, in, in 2000, late 2013 taking this to classrooms and teaching middle school and high school students about uh, perception, stereotypes, and the way journalism is made. Uh, in 2014 alone, we saw over 2,000 students in Chicago, in the Bronx, and in Washington, D.C. And one of the first things that we do in these workshops is we start off with a question that I started off here uh, with, is what do you think of when, when I say Africa? And um, we try to document what the responses are. 
Um, and frequently they're like this. I was teaching a, a class at South Dakota State University about three weeks ago and um, asked that question there, and these are the responses I got there from a, from a college audience. And um, in March, we got some funding from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting to go to Mombasa in Kenya and teach a six-day workshop with high school students there, trying to use everyday Africa to, again, talk to students about stereotypes, about perceptions, about photography, photojournalism, the way media is made, and we did this drill again. We did it in conjunction with a school in, on the north side of Chicago. And we had the students introduce to each other via Skype, and they were able to have conversations and share photography with each other. And um, we documented, well, first I'll show you this word cloud. The, over the course of last year of the students that we've seen, these are the words that American students come up with when they think about Africa. Now, there's a lot of things that are fascinating here, but I think it kind of speaks for itself. Um, with that student body in Mombasa, we asked those students in Kenya to tell us what they think of Africa, and this is what they had to say. So there's some, there's some overlapping words here, like wildlife and poverty and so forth, but there's obviously a, a much more diverse uh, and broader kind of examples of words and the ways that they think about their own culture. We also incidentally asked those students in Kenya what they thought of, thought of the US. You'll notice that right above fast food is the word Kardashians. I also thought it was funny that above New York is Russia. Um, so there's some, there's some misperceptions here as well, some stereotypes, but probably not quite along the same lines as, as those. So if, if everyday Africa is not trying to, to talk about these kinds of things, this is not the story we're trying to tell about Africa. What is the story we're trying to tell? Well, we're trying to, to, to say that in Africa, people join marching bands. And they go to work and rollerblade, and play in pools, get married, play with toy airplanes, study for exams, go to soccer games, they care about fashion, and they go to the beach, And they make paintings, and go to concerts, and they pose for school Facebook, uh, Facebook, <laughs> yearbook pictures. And they go to nightclubs, and play golf, and they vote in elections. They do laundry, and play polo, and they celebrate one year wedding anniversaries. And they audition for movies, and they go fishing, and they stare at solar eclipses. Now, one of the great things about Instagram is the stream effect. All of these images you get to see at once. So we're not trying to say that bad things don't happen. So you can find photographs of refugee children, of a man who's being persecuted against because he's gay in Uganda of a family that suffered from Ebola in Sierra Leone, and of a poor family in DR Congo. But because Instagram is a stream and you get to see all of these pictures together, that's not the only photograph you're seeing. You're also seeing these photographs next to images of daily life. Another thing that Instagram's allowed us to do is it's allowed us to really explore the conversations, the way that the people have perceptions about this part of the world and the way they want to talk about these things. So here's a photograph that Peter took of a girl reading a book on the street in Abidjan. And someone commented, would you do such a picture of a French girl? What's so astonishing about a girl reading a book in Ivory Coast? We try not to get into these conversations. We just let the followers fight it out. 
Um, and the response is, I'm not sure where your outrage comes from. It wasn't presented as astonishing that she was reading. It's simply a photo of everyday life in Ivory Coast, much like the rest in this series. A similar photo of a French girl would be an interesting and equally compelling image. This is a photograph of a girl bathing in Ghana. And someone comments, it's a beautiful picture, but a sad context. The response is, why is it sad? She's bathing organically, has clean water to do so, is in the sunshine, and heading to school. Please stop assuming that because life looks different than yours, it's tragic. Um, Instagram, the other thing that, that, that it's, of course, done for this project is it's allowed it, allowed it to explode in ways that are very similar to Live Love Beirut. About uh, a year and change ago, we noticed an account called Everyday Asia, and we linked up with them. Everyday Middle East, Everyday Latin America, Everyday USA. We, we're not collaborating with these people. We're starting a nonprofit, the Everyday Projects, and we're all working together to try to find ways to sort of uh, move forward in an organized fashion. A couple of the more interesting ones, I think, are Everyday Iran and Everyday North Korea which are using Instagram to show you parts of the world uh, that are even dif more difficult to, to see um, than places uh, perhaps like Africa. A couple of the projects that we've started as sort of offshoots, one is Everyday Bronx, which is uh, done um, uh, in conjunction with the education workshop we did up there, and Everyday Mombasa. And there are some uh, issue-based feeds now as well one that Elodie mentioned earlier, Everyday Incarceration, Everyday Black America, and Everyday Climate Change. The, um, the thing that we've found in these workshops that we do, be they one hour in length or six days in length, you're able to talk to the students about photography, about perceptions, about stereotypes, and you're, and you're able at least to get them to accept the fact that there are other ways about thinking about these parts of the world. There are other uh, sides of life. Uh, after just one hour with uh, a group of students in Chicago, uh, the first image I showed you earlier, the bad, hungry, poverty giraffe, um, we asked the question again, and they were able to come up with a, lot, a much longer list of words um, that do a much more uh, complex, um, varied example of what life is really like in, these, in that part of the world. And our hope is that thanks to the sort of exploding way that this is taking over uh, our lives and, in, and, and moving across Instagram, that we might be able to do this in lots of other places. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. And I'll just ask a couple of questions to get it going. From looking at your presentations from Beyonce to, to, to Lebanon and Africa, it seems that you're all re reacting to kind of a rig rigidity in media. You know, if it's Beirut, it has to be bad stuff. If it's Africa, it has to be bad stuff. If it's Beyonce, she, she has to look perfect or they'll never show it. So you, you all three seem to be sort of embracing a, a kind of an alternative view of the world, um, which is you know, obviously necessary. But, but how did it come to the point where you know, Lebanon, Africa, for example, always end up or often end up in such a negative way and you've had to do what, what, what you're doing. Is it because in the news there's only the bad stuff is worth reporting or, or what happened? Austin? Yeah. I can use two. I think... Um, okay, thanks. I, it's a it's a complicated question. Some of it has to do with you know if it bleeds it leads. The way that journalism um, requires that something bad happen, the train coming on time is not news. The train late to the station is news. I think at the same time, sort of that premise uh, combined with the shrinking space that international news is is given. Um, but I think at the same time, at least in a personal level, with the story that we were doing in Ivory Coast, there was an experience of you're going to a place to, you're on assignment. You have gone to a place with a preconceived notion of what you are there to do. And it's not that that's wrong. We weren't wrong about the fact that Ivory Coast was recovering from a decade or more of conflict. It's that when you go to a place like that, 
and you are walking into an environment with those thoughts in your head, you're hardwired to sort of only see the things that fit your story. And, um, and we were troubled by that experience. And so we wanted to try to find a way to notice the other things that were going on. And so I think one of the lessons out of this is hopefully you've done your research, hopefully you know what you're talking about enough to know that when you go to a place like that, yes, there is a story to track down, but also be open to what you do find when you're there. Um, that's hard to do in, in a shrinking space. Um, but the nice thing about Instagram and other social media platforms is it allows us space to do that. Um, I think that most most of why the reason why the media is is showing the bad stuff for Lebanon at least is that it's true. It's it's happening. There is a bomb every once in a while. There is conflict all around and inside. Um, but it's and it's been going on for fifty years now. Why we started is because it's it's tiring to hear it over and over and over again and not get to a solution. And the kind of stuff that we show not getting the amount of attention that the bad news gets. Also, the bad news seems to be getting a lot of attention, but we're not seeing any results. And we've been waiting for it to get better and waiting and waiting. My, par my grandparents waited, my parents waited, I'm still waiting. It's just tiring and that's, that's mostly why we started. Yeah, I mean, I, I have I agree. I think, you know, it's, uh, I also think, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I agree. And with, with your projects, for example, in Lebanon and Africa, how do you, is there any filtering or any control? Can anybody post? There's just certain people, or do you have to prove it? If somebody puts up something you don't like, does that ever happen? What, what, what goes on? You know, it's it's magical in a way and very surprising that um, so it's crowdsourced, so everybody can share an image on a hashtag. And in three years, we haven't gotten one political image. And for Lebanon, that is very, very surprising because you feel politics everywhere. And on every campus, you feel the presence of political parties, of politicians inside, through even young people just following them and dogma and everything. But on the hashtag, not one single political image. And we have 160,000 images today. Uh, we repost uh, the best images every day. And it's sort of a gamification for people to try and send us their best picture. Um, so no, it's crowdsourced and, and curated. That's, that's the principle of it. Yeah, the so Everyday Africa, it, there's a list of contributing photographers. And the, the logistics of it are yeah. that those individuals have the password, have the login information. We know, because we know them well and have worked with them, that they see, they have the same interests in mind that we do. And so they uh, are allowed to simply go online, go onto Instagram and post images as they come across something that's appropriate. Um, we also, on Fridays, try to do a Follow Fridays hashtag where we are looking for images that are hashtagged Everyday Africa by others and try to feature one of those a week as a way of reaching out and allowing some contributions from people who are not official with us. Uh, Everyday Everywhere is, um, is a curated thing that we do. That it's, the, the curation rotates among the people who are involved with the various Everyday projects and a curator will have it for two weeks and you're looking for the Everyday Everywhere hashtag so it ends up being sort of a best of, of the various everyday projects and also a way to reach out to others who, who are simply hashtagging their work that way. And Elodie, do you want to speak a little bit more about the prize now? What are you really hoping to get out of this? Is it going to change things? Is it just support a few people? Or is it going to be a new movement? Or what, what are you thinking? Well, I think, I think what we want is to support people and amplify voices and show the diversity of work that is happening out there that is actually not necessarily um, also happening in regions that have a lot of coverage like you know North America and, and, and Western Europe and that we want to give the photographers I mean not only obviously you know it's three grants of ten thousand dollars so that can make a difference and hopefully it will make a, a difference in these photographers' lives, but it's also about 
supporting them. So we are offering mentorship with our senior staff photographers so that they have people to talk to, you know, if they encounter an issue that they can call up people that they have been in, in, in situations where they had to um, talk through situations that could be um, either, you know, not even dangerous, but, but, but having a question about a certain subject that gave them information that, you know, they don't want to release or, or, or talk through situations. Um, and, you know, and, and, and training where needed. So our goal is to support photographers, but also to create a community that hopefully will be able to help each other um, through the years. I mean, that's really what the intent of the grant is as well. And now I'm going to ask a kind of negative question. What are the limitations of Instagram? What can it not do that you would like it to do? Or are you satisfied with it? There are always things that we're asking of the Instagram team to add Change to the functionality and, and so forth. Um, and I think Instagram is you know, listening, and, and, and they change things at their own pace. Um, the, the, I think in some ways, the, uh, the thing with Instagram for us is it's both our best friend, and it's something that we need to be wary of. Uh, without Instagram, we wouldn't exist, at least not in as uh, vibrant a way. Um, but one of the reasons that we are pursuing a book project, that we pursue exhibitions, that we are in classrooms, that we have our own website, is that we're trying to find as many other ways as possible to get the material out there so that we're not entirely um, dependent upon Instagram as the vehicle through which this has to be experienced. Okay. Um, some images, is, it hasn't allowed us to post. Um, for example, when we were working with brands and they were launching their advertising thing, uh, we cannot switch between accounts and it's very tiring. We cannot repost on Instagram like you can on Twitter, so we have third-party apps to do that. Um, or we have to screenshot what people send us. Um, we have a lot of frustrations with Instagram because we use it so much, but it's also a great platform. It's where everybody is. So for us, it's just a tool. Uh, we're also on Facebook and on Twitter, and now we're moving to Snapchat. So I think it's just a medium. Uh, I don't see it as something that's f uh, set in stone, but Social media is really moving, and we're just experimenting with it. And as, as I said, it's a dialogue between us and people, and wherever it happens, uh, whether it's Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And do you guys ever collaborate with mainstream media, meaning like would a newspaper give you a page of your everyday Africa or from Lebanon? Is there any kind of hybridization that works where you take social media and put it into mainstream media? We've been uh, published in several publications. Um, it's interesting because early on it was an idea that didn't seem to work very well for mainstream journalism for some of the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Um, but once it became popular, uh, you know, some of the uh, more prominent uh, photo blogs like, like Lens on the New York Times, Photo Booth on the New Yorker, Lightbox on Time Magazine, they've all featured us. But we've also been in print magazines as well. We were in National Geographic. We've been in Internationale and Newsweek Japan and other places. So there have been traditional publishing uh, ways that our work has gotten out there. We are also in the process of exploring other sort of more collaborative or longer term projects. Uh, one that we have started a couple weeks ago was with Al Jazeera. The, the Al Jazeera, um, it's called AJ Plus. And so AJ+, AJ Plus, their Instagram account, they reached out to us, and they are now, every now and again, every couple of weeks, putting together a 15-second video that features Everyday Africa photography in some kind of theme. Um, the one on s this past Sunday was Mother's Day. And so they posted to their account, we posted to our account, and we're trying to find ways to collaborate in, collaborate in a way that's helpful, helpful for both of us. So we're exploring things like that. We've been very guerrilla and underground. Underground? Well, yes, we, we, um, we've been published in newspapers uh, in, in Lebanon, and we've gotten press uh, a little bit in, in Europe and the States, but uh, not on a regular basis. 
And is there, the last question, then I'm gonna open it up. Is there any compensation model for contributors, for photographers, besides LEDs and crayons? <laughs> well, for us, we don't work with photographers. We work with people. So anybody sends us an image from my grandmother to, and there's, there are so many of them. We give them the bracelet. It's, it's what we can give them. This is a tough one. Um, um, I spoke at a panel at, at SVA last November, and someone asked a question along these lines and, and got a little angry, it felt, with me that I was somehow taking over photojournalism in a way that was devaluing the fact that the work should be paid for, et cetera. These are conversations that we have all the time, and we're constantly trying to figure out the right way to um, move forward. Um, it's a constant thing of trying to find the right, a fair rate if a magazine wants to use an image or a series of images, um, or if it's something like AJ Plus, is this a collaboration that helps us enough that that, that is useful? Um, are there ways in which we can try to gather, is the new currency the number of followers that you have? And I think that's certainly true for a lot of people. It's maybe one of the ways that they're getting you know, some sponsorship. Um, if we can build a large enough following, then does that mean that down the line you might be able to uh, be a more attractive candidate for grants to do a big education project, project for example? So can it lead to funding in that way? Okay. So why don't we open it up to, as you to put it to people, and then we'll see what you have to say. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Ralph, and I'm admired by all the work that you presented tonight. But I have a question for Austin. The second picture that you showed us is by Kevin Carter. He's showing the picture of a child in front of a vulture, and you know that he eventually committed suicide because he felt like some kind of responsibility because as a journalist, he was able to save the kid, but he ended up saving him. What I'm amazed by with the Live Love Beirut campaign is that it's not only there to uh, challenge stereotypes and change perceptions, it also helped a lot the community back. And it's based on Instagram, which is like a, a tool that people with their phone take pictures and they give back to community. So Live Love Beirut is giving back to community and helping the community in return. My question to uh, everyday everywhere and everyday Africa and all, etc., is is there some kind of mechanism or some kind of thinking that because you, you are taking pictures of impoverished people, is there some kind of uh, a thinking or thought to have those people in return later in any way possible? Or is it just there for the photojournalism that can be replaced by, the, by an app that shows portfolios? That's my question. Sure. Um, I, I, there's a number of ways I could answer that. Um, the, the, the po a couple of things. One is that we are mostly working journalists. However, we don't consider this necessarily, this is not the news. Um, it's a form of journalism, it's a form of storytelling most importantly. Um, and the, the point is, as I said when I was speaking, is that we're trying to rise above the media stereotypes. Um, most of our, we've had about 30 photographers contribute to the feed. Currently active, we may have 10 or so photographers who are the most active right now. And of those, more than half of them are African. And this is, this is a project that gets people out in the field taking photographs of everyday life, trying to demonstrate that so a lot of the pictures that I showed there, if you didn't know where they were taken, you wouldn't know where they were taken. They could have been taken anywhere. We're trying to show, and most of it is cell phone photography, incidentally. It started off as sort of a cell phone project, and then it became sort of, now it's not as strict. We try to encourage cell phone photography, but it's not all that way. Uh, it's an attempt to show, to depict everyday life in a way that is not shown in the media. And our hope is that that can help show that life is more complicated than what you see in the news every day. And if you can show that life is more complicated than what you see in the news every day, then you can help change perceptions. And maybe it's little by little, but you know, when I go to these schools and talk to 15-year-olds, and they already have these same ideas that adults have, these ideas start early. If you can change those perceptions in the classroom early on, then perhaps as they grow up, as they become decision makers, policy makers, 
that can have a more positive impact on the way the world works. 